And welcome to episode 22 of Rethinking Trauma and Transition. We challenge the stigma surrounding trauma and the healing through our podcast. We aim to empower those who are experiencing the challenges, providing them with knowledge and language necessary to embark on a transformative journey towards a more fulfilling life. And today, again, we are lucky to have our very special guest and friend, Kim from NAPAC. Thanks so much for having me back. I'm really enjoying our conversations. I'm really looking forward to today. We've loved them as well, Kim. Thank you. So far, we've covered an awful lot of ground. Kim, we've talked about um, what ACEs is, the impact in terms of the experiences and responses of both the child and the adult, and how that experience rolls over and continues to impact long into adulthood. What we wanted to kind of explore with you today was actually that post-acknowledgement phase of moving beyond that experience, because I think it's powerful and important that there's that recognition that that is entirely possible because change is always a possible option. Hmm. Well, isn't this, Kim, about what your doctorate is about, what we're chatting about today? It is. It is. Um, when I'm a disclosed survivor and over many years of accessing different support services and that myself, I was always I was always personally struck by the focus of conversations being about the abuse or the adversity. And then sometimes people would just, what do you want? I had no clue how to respond. I didn't even know what sort of context they were talking about what I might want, like in terms of the service or my education or my career or it, like it just didn't I didn't understand what they were trying to get to and then through my professional career obviously I've, I've done I know a lot of fundraising and written a lot of reports for different people and they'll have a list of questions about what kind of outcomes we're helping people achieve and those are often preset whether it's about you know their their health or like social engagement or are they in training for employment but it was never really about what the survivors themselves had defined. So having seen both sides of it, um, I did a master's about 10 years ago, and that's but that that specifically looked at social impact analysis, like how we develop, deliver, and evaluate projects specifically for vulnerable adults, and I specifically looked at domestic and sexual violence services, because I'd I'd worked in that sector and I knew it was quite tricky. So when I got the opportunity with NAPAC to actually work on a doctorate. I really wanted to try and find out what it was survivors said themselves that they wanted and to kind of proactively make that effort to see what they'd already said, like what we could already learn from what survivors had, had said themselves that might not be framed really neatly as this is the outcome I want, this is the impact I want to see. Because a huge part of it was looking at the language survivors used themselves. Yeah and doing the work as a researcher, as an analyst, as a professional, to kind of then translate that and connect that in to what's happening in terms of policy and advocacy and funding, where it's normally the other way around. Yeah, because as we were chatting beforehand, it seems that in a, some circumstances, it seems to be a, a very restrictive, very ideological kind of method of there's a survivor, this is a sausage factory, and you would all fit into that sausage factory, and no matter what happens, that's it. Yeah, a lot of things are very defined. And sometimes that is not always a bad thing. Like Sometimes having really clear definitions can be helpful. But if you don't quite fit neatly into those boxes, and we know a lot of people who've had you know multiple adverses, multiple abuses, find it harder to fit into those boxes, especially when there's an and. It's like when I worked for, you know, looking specifically at domestic and sexual violence, it's like sometimes that's quite an easy box to tick. But for some people, it was a bit harder if there hadn't been contact abuse, if it had just been verbal abuse. They weren't sure whether that service was right for them. So quite quickly, you found people on the periphery who were eligible for support, who needed support, but were struggling to access it because before they even did, there was they were kind of trying to judge whether what they had experienced was bad enough. And that's a horrible place to be. And we talked about this before, where you're kind of comparing your experience with others and does it fit this mould? And that can be quite a difficult process to go through to try and fit in. 
I don't know, for some people that makes it easy. It's like, oh, yes, that's me. I can access that service. But I was always interested in, like, that. there's so many people for whom it's not really clear that that's something that they can utilise. Mm. It's one of the things oh. I love about NAPAC. Yeah, I guess that would leave those people in a kind of a state of limbo, wouldn't it? Because they're not sure this organisation, that organisation, both organisations, all these organisations, or where where they go with all that kind of thing. Exactly. And it can be quite overwhelming, especially if you're at that place where you kind of know you want to feel so, you want you want you want some support. You're kind of recognizing there were these things that, you know, weren't right and that have impacted you. And you kind of want to talk it through with someone. It's like when you're not even sure what those conversations might look like, whether that's a one-off conversation before getting onto some practical support or whether that's an ongoing therapeutic kind of conversations, maybe both. Maybe you're feeling really vulnerable because, you know, you're, you're, you're struggling to access secure housing and you kind of need that. And you're looking at Maslow's hierarchy of needs that you kind of want some security before you can work on some of the psychological healing, but you're kind of aware that you're feeling vulnerable and that's making it harder to fill in that paperwork like, how do you navigate all these different things? One of the reasons I love NAPAC is that there, there are no barriers to access in the service. There's no referral process. People can just call and we can provide them with that emotional support and help them connect in with the different services, help them navigate all those different options they have. Because there's lots, there are lots of different options out there, but that in itself can be difficult to find the ones that might be right for your circumstances. So it really helps being able to give that emotional support and a bit of practical insight into that, that information. And then they get to choose what they're most comfortable with. It's, in a way, it's also sometimes, I think, what you're describing is that sometimes our experiences aren't single flavours. They're like a pick and mix of flavours. The problem is, is that sometimes the services that we're trying to access are only designed for one flavour. Yes. And where NAPAC comes in is it has the capacity and the awareness to be able to have that holistic overview of all the different flavours to say actually from what you're disclosing from your experiences and you're able to signpost then in terms of potentially effective routes for that support, for that structure that would give the most efficient su support possible for the individual. And starting from that survivor-led, person-centred, trauma-informed perspective, so mm -hmm. you, know, you get to choose what you share and what you say, and it's you were working with, what you were listening to. And it might be, you know, you're able to say there's these particular things and we're then able to, you know, help you say, hey, there's this specialist service that might be able to help with that bit. But you mm -hmm. don't have to start by picking apart what those bits are. You can talk to us about you know, what yeah. it's like being a survivor. You can, you know, practice the first disclosure with us before you tell a therapist or something like that. You can work out where your boundaries are and how much information you're comfortable sharing or not sharing and what might or might not be appropriate for the different services you want to access so you feel safer having those conversations. Yeah. And, it, you know, it, people contact us at all different stages of their recovery. Because we never know, I and mean, we, we we use this analogy a lot about like recovery being a journey. It's almost like you know you can think of it as a, a a path, and that sometimes there's you know a bit of a pothole. We come up against a challenge, or there's a bit of a rock in the way. We have to sort of climb over. There's always times where we might need a bit of extra support. It strikes me that that visibility, that deciding what you disclose, what you don't, where your boundaries are sitting is incredibly important, particularly when you may have masked, hidden, denied, or chosen not to acknowledge these experiences for a long period of time. There's almost like a decision point over what am I comfortable with bringing out into the open and what does open look like for me? Yeah. Hugely. I mean, we hear from people from the age of 18 up, I mean, literally from, from 18 to in their 90s, very different life stages, different types of experience, because when when their childhood was, might be a couple of weeks ago, it might be a couple of decades ago. And there's some things that we found are in common across that for all the diversities, like two things that come up a lot. 
is that people want to feel a bit better. Whether they just want to tell us to tell someone once so they can, you know, get it off their chest, phrase they use. They just want, they want to tell somebody. They don't want it to be a secret anymore. And the difference between it being like a secret and just something they don't want to share, like, you know, that they've told somebody and that they feel a bit better about about themselves in that way. And then they want to help other people. They don't want anyone else to go through what they went through. And that's where our advocacy work comes in. So it's like we will listen and we will go and, you know, strive to make those changes to improve safeguarding, to improve support, to improve that, you know, the understanding of why trauma-informed practices are so important because you shouldn't have to disclose to be treated with that kind of kindness. So the kind that that kindness and that awareness should come first. There's a lot of work to do. <laughs> mm. But um, it's bit, those two elements are so important. Yeah. I'm curious, Kim, as if you have any long term people on your books, as it were, from when they first make that contact with yourselves, does their language progress and change over time from say like I am to this happened? Well, we don't. Our services are all confidential and anonymous. Yeah, yeah. It's not like someone has a case file with us so we can see if they if they call a lot. I mean, we'll know there's some people that use our service multiple times because they'll tell us. But it's more from, again, it, it, it's, it's listening to what they tell us rather than us sort of trying to, you know, work with in a case way. It's why NAPEX is quite unique. It's like, you know, people can call, like, I think it's like a bubble. Like people can talk to us and almost practice what they want to say, go through just how they're feeling before perhaps disclosing to their therapist. A lot of people call us before or after disclosing to their therapist because, you know, because they feel like this is such a significant thing to disclose and they want to work out how they feel about it. So what's, what's the typical experience? Well, I suppose there's nothing typical, but if I was phoning NAPAC mm -hmm. for the first time today, yep. what would my experience be like? It would be entirely based on what it was you needed. I mean, I love our support team. They're such fantastic people. And it's a mix of paid staff and volunteers. Um, and there's always a supervisor there who can, you know, make sure they're debriefing after every call as well. It's, they're really well supported. But we offer it's just about half an hour because we find that that's works best for the callers as well because that's a, a nice amount of time to be able to talk through mm -hmm. things whilst then being able to sort of carry on and, you know, go make a cup of tea afterwards, whatever it is they need after having that conversation. But many of us ask, like, you know, what would you like to talk about today? You know, what, what, what's, is there anything happening that you want to talk through? How are you feeling? There's no like preset questions we go through. There's no, not like a call center with a script. It's why we're a support service, not a helpline. Because we don't have like a route we're trying to take anyone down in, in that way. Like we want to manage the service in a way so it, it works really well for people. So it's not an ongoing therapeutic service. We don't take details and make referrals for people. We'll provide them with the information so they're the ones in that position of power to make decisions about what services they might want to contact, what calls they want to make, what emails they want to send. But they're they're in that position where they get to be informed and make those choices so it's kind of it, 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 it really varies it's a very varied service and it's one of the the strengths of the way it's managed is that there's so many different types of calls some people just want to phone for five minutes to get a quick referral like they know what they need like they're a survivor they're having some housing issues is there a good service or well, they're a survivor they're doing their, their benefits claim they want some help with pip is there a good person to talk to about that Maybe they're thinking of like looking at their civil law options, the civil options of a dress scheme, perhaps. Who do they talk to about that? Of course, we've got our law firm partnership program. But we've got some firms we work really closely with and the APAL, who are really good for that kind of support. So we like connect them in. But they still get to be the ones who decide who they call and what they tell. And that's really, really, really important because they get to be in that, that decision-making position. Whereas for a lot of people who have experienced abuse and adversity, they didn't always get to make decisions. They didn't get to choose things for themselves. They didn't get to say what they wanted. It's it was someone them, else. It's helping that person be re-empowered, isn't it? Very much. 
very much. And I think empowerment's a term that I know I used to he hear so much through mm. through work, and it was people really struggle to define what it means. And one thing I love about NAPEC and the work we get to do now is that we're actually pretty clear on what empowerment means. It means that we trust you, we believe you, we'll help you access the information you need so you can make an informed decision about what you want to do next. And you get to make those decisions. You get to work out what it is you want to say and what you want to do. And that can be, it can be quite challenging if you've never been asked what you want or what you want to do. If you're used to people making those decisions for you, it can be quite hard to suddenly start trying to do those things for yourself. Yeah. But that's again why we provide that emotional support so people can talk through what they're struggling with and why they think that they're, they're, they're struggling so they can kind of become more comfortable making those decisions and doing those actions and engaging with their recovery in that way and how empowering that really is. So yeah. if I was to describe what I've heard you say. Yes, let's see if I've said it right. Yeah. We'll see if I've picked it up. I've picked up everything. What I've heard you describe is in essence that very well informed friend who doesn't judge, who doesn't push you down roots, who doesn't take away your power and your ability to make decisions for yourself, but will ask very good, insightful, informed questions that will help you reach those decisions yourself. Exactly that. And trust you to take the next steps. Yes. When it's right for you. Exactly. There's a huge amount of respect for people that comes through this work of where, you know, we lead you and we trust that you can act in your own best interest. And we can provide you with the information. We can make those those steps a little bit closer and a little bit easier. Mm. But it, it's that trusting someone and giving them that information and letting them decide what's the right thing for them. Because only they know all the different things that impact their lives, their preferences, what their comfort lo levels are. There's no point us saying, you definitely need to make this phone call. If they really hate making phone calls, maybe they felt comfortable talking to us, but that doesn't mean they're comfortable always making phone calls. Maybe they want to make an email. Maybe they want to go to the office. Even little things like that, it's really important that that person gets to choose what they're going to do and the way they're going to do it. Yeah. Well, I think what, what, was, what was really important, sorry, Rich, was at a time that's right for you yeah. because sometimes I think maybe and correct me if I'm wrong Kim I think one of the things that maybe people feel anxious about is if I have or make this phone call will I then be pushed to do something that I'm not sure I'm ready to do when actually I might need to take that away and have a think about it I might need to sit with that for a while until I'm comfortable in the next step because actually this first step was big enough yeah. yeah, we we know it can take. I mean, like the the average is over twenty years for people to make a first disclosure based on. We did a massive analysis of our data, um, and that was known what people were telling us, like how long. We know there's more younger people calling now, which means that looks like for some people at least that's getting smaller, which is great. Like the, the, being able to access support earlier is great because it means you've got so much more of your life ahead of you with, with the recovery process and being a bit more comfortable about yourself and with those experiences and, you know, feeling comfortable with those boundaries. But we know as well, I mean, from when all the revelations have happened about celebrities having been found to be perpetrators, sometimes there'll be a lot of calls that happen within 24 hours, 72 hours of, of the news coming out. But what we've also found is there'll be weeks and months and years later, people will still make those calls because it's sat with them. There's no deadline. There's no right time externally to make that kind of decision. It's entirely down to what you're comfortable with. And then as well, like we'll give someone in, some information if they want to access a, a particular service, we can help them find what they might want to do. But then there's no deadline for when they need to do that we're not going to say well we're going to follow up with you in a week and make sure you've made that call it doesn't happen it's one of the you know we, we we sit very separate to that you know we're just there as a resource for survivors and survivors are our priority 
whether they're disclosed or undisclosed or supporters, however they want to define, it's like, that's fine. We're not going to, there's not like a questionnaire you have to fill in and like gatekeeping to access. You get to choose what you're comfortable saying and then how you want to then proceed. And we know that it, a lot of times it does take people a while to feel comfortable. Sometimes people will email before they're comfortable calling because they just kind of want to make sure this is the right fit for them. Like, do we have support for them? And, you know, we can say, yeah, you can call us whenever you're ready. And it's always what we say is that like, whenever you're ready, when it's when it suits you. And sometimes the support line is busy, so that first call might not get through. Evenings are sometimes a bit quieter. But it's still, it's so important that it's when someone's comfortable having that conversation and then when they're comfortable taking those next steps. Because it's it, there is a big emotional part of this. It's important we feel ready. We can be ready on paper, but being emotionally ready to take those steps so we get to do those things in our own time, in our own pace, is really important. And only, you know, only they get to know when that is. As we were talking about previously, Kim, and you were saying that's a, probably the most crucial step is that first phone call and that person's healing journey. First disclosures are so, yeah. so important. I think sometimes people are worried about hearing a first disclosure and how they might react. And I understand that, but you just, just focus on what the, the, the person but how are they feeling? Like, thank you for telling me. How are you feeling? How can I support you? Some little phrases that can be really helpful and just help you stay focused on the person who, who's who's talking to you and what they need. And then you don't have to worry about getting things wrong. Like, just I'll ask them what they need, how, how they're feeling. Thank them for the trust. It's a good place to start. As I was listening to that last question, what occurred to me was that that first disclosure may also be the first time they've actually spoken those words out loud. And that means that that's a very different experience from thinking it. Mm. Because that might also be the first time you've heard yourself say that. Yep. And that in itself can be quite massive. Mm. Because it's a it's a different level of acknowledging of your own experiences. Mm. It's one of the reasons that we take first disclosures so seriously and why. So it's not just because it's a first disclosure, because someone might have been coming to terms with what their experiences were for a long time. But to tell someone else can feel quite big and one of the things i found as well is as a, like the first time you say it out loud it's like yeah you're hearing yourself say it but then you've also that's the first time you've kind of found what words you want to use to say like, how do you describe your experience what word do you use do you use adversity or abuse or trauma or you know, what, what word is it that you feel most comfortable with? And you might find that you know, if you tell other people, that's still the first time you're telling them. And that can also then, you might change the language a little bit. You know, you, sometimes over time you find other you know, the, the words that you're most comfortable with and that helps you feel a bit safer, a bit more comfortable that maybe helps you hold a boundary to maybe you don't want to be asked questions about it or you don't want to share anything else. So you might say, that's all I'm comfortable saying. Or you might be comfortable talking about it and be like, no, if you, if you, as I am, you can ask me anything. I'll say if I don't want to answer. You know, that you can, you can find what your comfort level is. But that first time, you've not really been able to practice any of that. But maybe that's also about practicing the, and that's as much as I'm comfortable with statement too. Yes, I think so. If you have denied your experiences, if you have been told that your experiences are not to be shared, to be kept a secret, are, and and everything's placed you in that that point where you can't talk, you don't talk, you shouldn't talk. Yeah. 
Yeah. Then there's a layer of decision making over what happens if I talk. How will it feel when I talk? How will what will I think when I talk? And how much and what do I talk? Yeah. Uh, potentially, is- well, Ali, I think is also what judgments we put on me as well. Yeah. Very much. Yeah, definitely. It's it's a lot that suddenly becomes very real. And when we're interacting with other people around disclosures and how much we're comfortable with disclosing, what even that means. I mean, one, I'm a disclosed survivor. I mean, I've done, you know, I've told fragments of my story to, to different outlets. So some of it's very public. But they're, only, they're still only fragments. And it's not entirely in my own words. And not in, you know, there's little facts they got wrong, but it's like you're clarifying so much. It's like, actually, I'll let that slide because the bulk of it's right. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's kind of difficult going back, trying to get them to edit. It's, it's emotionally exhausting. So it's like, that's my boundary, is that actually I'm going to let a little bit of the copy editing errors go because actually the bulk of what I want to say is in there. And that, like, okay, that's fine. And recognizing where my boundaries were with some of that. But even as someone who is a disclosed survivor, one of the things I've noticed is that people don't always then ask what I've survived. One of the fun things is that some of the assumptions people make about what that means will be true. But it was also helping them realize that there's assumptions we both make when we talk about these things and what the implications might be for our relationship and what our needs are, and that that's, it's okay. That's kind of a natural thing that we do. And if we're open to being asked and answering questions, we can say, you know, if you'd rather not, you can say not as well. Like it's okay to find where you're most comfortable with. So I came up, I came to sort of realization of, of what a lot of this was. And I know I've said this phrase before, but it's like that life after abuse is so important. But sometimes you don't want to talk about the details of the abuse because there's other things you want to be focusing on. You want to be focusing on the, what comes next. Mm-hmm. And that's where you like, you're the protagonist of your story. And you get to make those decisions as like the lead character in your life. What is it you want to be able to do? And kind of working out what some of those options are. What what are the things you're interested in and you enjoy doing with your time? And sometimes that takes a bit of trial and error if you didn't get to explore a lot of those things during your development and like teen years. Especially if you were then also like coping with trauma. That's not quite the same as making positive decisions if you're actually reacting to emotions and, you know, the, the stresses and the recovery process. Um, there's a lot of things that we do call that maladaption because you're, you know, working through the stress of it and trying to do sometimes the same or the opposite, but it's still kind of shaped sometimes by those experiences rather than just what we think we like, what we are actually interested in. And so there can sometimes be, in, you know, through adulthood where you go through that process and it's it can be really important to to do that. I often think that's really important, that life after abuse. Not despite or regardless or imagining it didn't happen, but we can acknowledge it's there and then still go on to make choices that best suit us. And a lot of that can be really fun and positive stuff. Like if you always wanted to learn to play an instrument when you were a kid, maybe as an adult you've actually got capacity to say i want to do this and go and have some lessons or you know look up the the tutorial videos online or you know take up crochet or guitar or whatever whatever these things are that you just think i'd like to try that yeah and sometimes we're taking up something new and it just enjoying for the sake of enjoying you don't have to be good at it nope that was a big thing I had to learn as well. <laughs> it's like for a long time, I was saying to people, it doesn't matter if you're good at it. You can just like, it's just enjoying it is being good at it. And then I applied that to myself and realized it's, it's quite hard sometimes doing that. It's like, it sounds good, but doing things that you enjoy can be a huge discovery process. 
and that, a huge part of the recovery as well just connecting in with those like just what you enjoy like what makes you feel happy and interested it's a huge part of recovery is sometimes getting to make those decisions and like a lot of recovery stuff is based around the healing and that's like with, with NAPAC services are there that support information and choice three hugely key parts of that and one of the reasons we do that is you know the huge part of that is that he, helping people with the healing and coming to terms with what happened but there's also that it's about them mm. it's you know it, it it's, it's about them feeling whole and worthy and being able to make those decisions and, and work out what it is they want what they need and that being a priority is part of that process then kim giving the people who do call you the encouragement mm. to move on mm. knowing it's possible hope is a massive massive part of what we do and it, it's knowing that things can and do get better and when, you know, if you're living with like, anxiety and depression, that can be really hard. And you have those days where it feels that there's so much negativity and there's so much that negative feeling that's within you. Being able to talk to someone about that and talk about like what it is you actually want. And sometimes those wants might be framed more as like negative. Like I want less anger. I want less people interfering. I want, you know less of these concerns and stresses but you can see that on the flip side what that might mean is i want more security i want more positive outlets i want more time to myself i want more time with my friends it's like some you can begin to see where those positives are that are to do with what it is you value in your life and being able to make those decisions but that can be a really emotional and quite long-term transition where you're going from like coping with what's happening to prioritizing yourself. And then there's sort of two sides of the same sort of same coin, if you like. I'm going to I'm gonna pause that mm. two sides in a slightly different way. Mm. And it's kind of picking up a follow on from the question you just asked Rich as well. Because quite often when Rich and I are working with people, mm. What we come across is an ability to meet their needs, mm. but a difficulty recognising their wants. Yes. Because want is a totally different arena from need. Need mm. is that lowest level of Maslow's hierarchy in terms of some basic survival. Want takes it to the next level. Want becomes more aspirational. Want becomes more about the things that aren't necessarily always essential, but are enriching for our life experiences. Yeah. When I did my thesis, I found there were 10 self-identified positive outcome themes. And they were themes, it was, because even within each area, there were different kinds of words people used. So it made sense to cluster them as a theme. Like, what are these kinds of topics that people want? And the top two were support and justice. Makes sense. That you know, the law of abuse is a it's a crime. Wanting justice makes sense. What justice was was often quite a complex concept. Mm -hmm. It wasn't always with criminal justice or civil justice. Sometimes it was about no social, family, personal, a personal sense of justice. But like people believing you was sometimes a big part of what felt just. But one of the things that struck me was like it was like 0 0.7 out of the 10 that was actually to do with aspirations, where for a lot of people who haven't had the adverse to abuse, if you ask people what they want, they'll much quicker come down to things like about a career or holidays or fun things. But for survivors, that was much lower down on the list. Mm. There was lots of things you would consider needs that were higher up in this list of the kinds of things they were just describing they wanted as outcomes. But that aspiration point was quite far down. And, you know, it was, it was there. People were talking about those kinds of things they really wanted. But what was fascinating about that as well was, was that 
how it showed that it, it can be quite hard and a bit of a process for some survivors to recognize what it is they they want and be able to work through identifying it and then working out how to make it realistic and then how to start working towards it and how that was a whole other process when you're just used to having to focus on what you need or what other people need and are imposing those needs on you or imposing their wants on you. And one of the to be familiar to you, where other people's wants are more important than your needs. That's one of the issues with an abuse and adversity, where even though it's something you need, it gets devalued because someone who's got more power prioritizes their wants. And that can then be a very confusing thing to unravel through healing. That's perception, isn't it, of that other person having more power than the other person until they manage to resolve that difference. Exactly. That's why there's so much healing that can be done in adulthood because we have so much more self-determination and and that is why there's so much more hope because we're not in that position we were when we were younger where we're kind of within an environment we can't really control we don't really get to make that many decisions and then you get to adulthood and you can and we can start you know reflecting on our wants and our needs and our own behaviours and, you know, working on things over time so we get to be into a a happier, more optimistic place. What I'm going to pick up on there is, again, is, is is the point you were making, Rich, as well. Because some of that dynamic, I think, sounds a bit like it's almost the... The knowings we carry about the assumptions other people place on us over what we and how we respond to them, what our role with them is, what their expectation of our interactions are, their assumptions about our experiences, whether they're right or wrong. And that those then colour our interactions and place boundaries in terms of what we share, what we don't share. Mm -hmm. That want conversation is about shifting those boundaries, shifting that sense of who I am and how do I start to redefine that not only with the previous assumption holders, if I choose to do so, but also with myself. And... NAPAC is that safe place to explore that with, that you can ask the questions over, well, what happens next if you'll get a very informed answer that that doesn't place you in a position of decision-making, but just gives you the information you need so that when it's right for you, you can make a decision that can give you an indication of the resources available to you if you wish to make use of those. But fundamentally, what it does is give you visibility of the fact that there are options to to, to help you move forward from where you are just now. And that's, it's one of the things I find really profound about what we do, is giving people a space where they can talk about and prioritize how they feeling. Because even if they're making what looks like, you know, a, a, a sort of logical decision about whether they're telling someone to their family, what whether they're telling their employer, whether they're, you know, all these different kinds of things they might be interacting with and where it might be relevant or they're worried it's relevant or not. You know, there's all these different feelings that come up with these these acts and decisions and they can talk that through with us independent of whether they tell anybody else and they can say like this like how how emotionally heavy some decisions feel because of all those experiences and having somewhere that you can actually talk about that independent like independently is so so important for survivors because it's 
you know, understanding abuse and trauma and recovery makes such a difference when you're saying, okay, this is this is where I'm at. This is the fork in the road where I'm at. I'm trying to work out what to do. And it's really emotionally loaded because of all this stuff. And just having somewhere where you can talk through what what your hopes and fears are without anyone judging you who understands the basis for some of those feelings makes a huge difference and can make those next steps just seem you know, more within reach and help you work out this is the one I want to do because this is the one that feels right for me. And that can be really important first, you know, it's important for everyone, particularly for survivors, getting to make those decisions that are in their best interest, with them being the people who know the most about their life and their story and their wants and their needs. I'm wondering, Kim, is what ways can people support NAPAC? Oh, wow, that's a great question. Um, Be honest I think- with it. I mean, there's some of the best ways people can support us is by, you know, more on social media and sharing the posts, sharing the links so more people can find us. There's a particular page about what to expect from a call that kind of explains what that service is and what it's not. So kind of understanding that we're here, that we don't have a referral process and that like any adult survivors can call or email or get that support online. Really important. That's the first most important way you can support us is helping more survivors find out that we exist. Um, I think becoming a bit more trauma informed really helps. There's some training on our website. The one that's the most basic one, which is an introduction to abuse, trauma and recovery. I co-wrote it. And it is, and then there's a lot of information in there that's probably available public domain. There's some bits on there that's on our website, but that course will just take you through in a structured way. And that's only thirty pounds, and it's three hours of CPD, and it takes you through the basics of what of what we're talking about when we're talking about these things. And we've also got trauma informed survivor support on there that's more aimed at professionals, and that can give you the basics. We also do bespoke and tailored in person online training. Um, me and a couple of colleagues deliver that. And that's a really good way of knowing that you're going to be able to support not just disclosed survivors, but the undisclosed survivors so that the people who are there who maybe aren't telling you that they've got these experiences, that you're able to then deliver a service that you know is going to be helping them as well as the people who are disclosed. And your colleagues who may well be disclosed or undisclosed survivors and you managing the the vicarious trauma of, of listening and caring so much and making sure you stay okay. And then the third option would be donating. And we we rely a lot on our funding, of course, for how much we can deliver and how much we can do. Um, one of the things I'm immensely proud of is how cost-effective NAPAC is and how much of our funding goes to providing support services for survivors, both the support line and when we have funding available, we run the support groups. But it's, you know, it's, it's, what is it, about 87% of our funding goes directly to supporting survivors, like the the part of it that goes on to the, the admin and the governance. That's also really well spent because we've really improved our governance and we'll, you know, make sure we run in an ethical and efficient and effective way. So it's an important part of making sure the service works. Yeah, there is a lot of controversy around some certain charities spending more on certain things than actually the help. Yes. But- it's one of the things I, I like to make clear about NAPAC is there's currently only five of us at head office. The rest of the team is the support team. We have the bulk of our team is the support team and they're you know supported by volunteers. If you're in the Manchester area, there's sometimes volunteering roles or volume recruitment for that. We like we value having a portion of our income going to our governance because it's this is really important work to get right. Mm-hmm. And what's really important, we operate well as a charity and organization and we manage our money well and we manage our people well. That's really important. But we always want the funding 
to be focused on survivor support. Well, I guess that also helped. That funding also helps with advocacy as well. Hugely, yeah. It enables us. Um, I mean, my role is kind of split across doing delivering training and doing advocacy work and managing bits of fundraising work. Um, I do a lot of that sort of outward facing element. Um, and the advocacy work is hugely important. I mean, I think a lot of people know about the ICSA and its final report that came out last year and the government working on its responses now and putting things into policy. And it's hugely important because like 7,000 survivors took part in ICSA and they pack every single year. We, we, like 10,000 people are supported. Like we, we deliver support 10,000 times a year. And it's so important that we make sure we're standing up for people and that we make sure that where there's rooms where those decisions are being made, that survivors are being considered. And that's a hugely important part of what we do because that's where we're going to see improvements to, to safeguarding for children. We're going to see improvements to the kind of support that's available for adults. We're going to see the kind of improvements within you know, the health service and within the justice systems where survivors are able to actually access those services because they're a little bit more trauma informed and that if they you know make a disclosure that there's appropriate responses and appropriate services offered and that they're given those that information and that choice as much as possible it's a huge a hugely important part of what we do well in a way that advocacy and that publicity it's also permission giving because it starts to have conversations that previously were kept in the dark. Yeah. It brings them out into the light. It acknowledges that That's much as though we would want it to be otherwise, these things happen. Yeah. And, and I know it, it can be it can be hard to engage with, but it's so important. I mean, it's one of the reasons I love the work that I get to do. And it's really hard sometimes, but it's really positive being able to demonstrate that there is hope and that recovery can happen and that there are there are things that we've learned that really help people heal and recover and that we're then able to to share that and you know it's why the first thing is always awareness knowing that we exist knowing that this it's okay to want and need to talk about this and that there are options for doing that and that you can get to choose what kind of support you want and what kind of services you feel comfortable accessing. And you can like choose to engage with them and you're the one who gets to make those decisions. And then through that becoming something that's, that's spoken about more and that, you know, that there's some campaigns and there's some of the social media things, like the different things we get to talk about that help people realize that they did nothing wrong and it's okay to need some support and to access some support so they can feel a bit better, make more of those kinds of decisions for themselves that they want to be making. And that being that, you know, looking to the future and feeling really hopeful and that you don't have to kind of compromise who you are and what your experiences are to be able to do that. So you don't have to hide them. You can, you know, come to terms with it, that healing, not coming to terms with it can be a huge part of the recovery process even if the only person you ever tell is yourself and that's still hugely powerful may i suggest kim that you are probably a prime example of someone who's gone through what they've gone through and dealing with it being able to survive and thrive and yeah go on doing what you're doing yeah and i'd also point out that i still have bad days so it's we... not like it's suddenly magically i'm okay and that's, I think, quite important to reflect on. Doing this work still affects me. I still get triggered at times. I still get upset at times. But that's that's okay. I'm just I'm just one person. But it so happens I had adversity and abuse in childhood, and I had a, a slightly turbulent, shall we say, teenage and young adulthood, and then I worked really hard to heal and worked really hard to recover and then was able to kind of blend all these different parts of my life together and to, to focus on this as something that I'm able to help make sure other people are heard and considered. And I do hugely value that I get to do this work and do it as someone who's a disclosed survivor with lived experience. 
because I, you know, years and years ago, I, I got to, you know, speak at events sometimes as, as the survivor, the token beneficiary. And it was quite painful sometimes back then. You'd have your five minute slot and you'd talk about how terrible your experiences were. And everyone felt sorry for you. And then you saw that was it. And I really hated those experiences, but I still felt it was really important that someone stood up. And I didn't want someone to stand up who didn't want to or didn't feel able or didn't have the support because no one should be in a position where they feel they have to disclose or have to talk publicly when they're not ready or they don't want to or doesn't suit their circumstances. So we always felt like I was quite privileged that I, I could talk about some of what happened to me and then use that as kind of a thing under the wedge to be able to bring in these other this other things that I learned and, and, and knew was really valuable and kind of wanting services to to consider the way they supported survivors and the kind of language they used and just help more survivors feel a bit more comfortable in themselves. And it also helps, I think, as well, is people know they're not alone. Somebody may not have gone through exactly the same experience, but there's people who have gone through similar experiences. And that you can find, you know, kindred allies out there mm. who will find you relatable. And that can be quite sad. I find it quite sad when people would hear bits of my story and say, hey, me too. Because I know how painful it was. And so that's why I came to that thing of like, thank you for telling me. Is there anything you need? Because it's it's a it's a really powerful thing to connect with people on. But it's also one of the things that, that drives me as well. I do want to improve the, you know, improve things so fewer people have those experiences. But there's 8.5 million adult survivors in England and Wales. About a billion people globally were a very silenced, very large group of people who will have relatable elements of our experiences or our feelings. And it's it's unfortunately far more prevalent than we'd want it to be. That also means there's far more of us who can, you know, support each other and be aware of what we want and need and look out for each other, which can be quite Quite hopeful as well like all, all that part of, of, of what we're able to do when we're bringing in collective voices the kind of change we're able to make on the national and international level to you know improve the way children are supported and kept safe and improve the way that adults are supported and encouraged and what recovery looks like and how recovery in itself is such an optimistic thing so if you're a young person and you're going through something now and you're not sure what to do or what to speak out, knowing there's adults who, who were there and what they've done and that it that we will believe you can be hugely powerful for knowing that you can you can take those steps and, and, and find someone you trust to tell and you know advocate for yourself in that way. It's a hugely powerful thing. And I'm hoping that's one of the things that changes going forward, that the more adults are recognized as survivors and supported and that that's seen as a that that positive step that will help more of younger people and children as well take those steps knowing that they're sort of coming into a community where you're believed and supported and that it is hopeful as you were talking there kim you kind of felt like you were picking this ahead because what occurred to me was that part of bringing your story into the open to the extent that you the individual are comfortable with is also adding to that body of evidence that says it's possible to move beyond this. Yep. It's possible to have more, to expect more, to live more mm -hmm. than just your previous experiences. And that means that for everyone that takes that journey when it's right for them, they add to that value or that, that evidence of belief for those whose time to take that step hasn't maybe quite arrived yet, mm -hmm. maybe thinking about it. Mm. And it, it's why I like to make clear, like I happen to be a disclosed survivor, but there are still parts of my experience I don't disclose. Mm. And that's totally fine. Like we're allowed privacy. We're allowed mm. to look after ourselves. And no one has the right to your story. Like no one, you don't, you don't, you, know, you don't have to tell people what you don't feel comfortable telling them. And that's why I think it, it, it's good that there is, you know, there's people who are disclosed survivors and with lived experience who will and can be public. Not everyone can. 
So it's you shouldn't feel you have to do it. Well, and like pretty, I get to... sorry, Kim. That's probably why your support group is so vital because it's anonymous. Yes, exactly. So it's they, they, they to and now, high public profile person or whatever that that is, they can be seen to be disclosing to the general public. Yeah, very useful. Yeah. And that's not just that, that, and I suppose where, where my thought was coming from is that different flavors of disclosure. Yeah. It's the it's the disclosing almost to yourself of your experiences yeah. and finding a safe place to explore that, because yeah. as you say, it you have the you have the decision over how public or how private you keep that. Yeah, and that's why I take it. I think our advocacy can be so incredible because. Like with, with my research, I looked at, and it was all totally anonymous and confidential, but I was looking at what people had, had said they wanted when they called us over over 15 years. It was over 80,000 calls. And I was just looking at that one bit. So it was all, everything's completely anonymous, completely confidential. And it was like, I wanted to know, can we look at, well, what do we find when we scratch the surface of this? And it was incredibly powerful what just came out of that. And I think it one of the things I'm proudest of from having done that bit of research and doing it the way I did it was like, look, we don't have to compromise on the confidentiality and anonymity. You can still retain that really robust way and still give voice to these people. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, that's one of the things I'm, I'm perhaps proudest of because so often it's only like us, um, us disclosed survivors and what we choose to disclose that makes it into like in, in, informing those kinds of advocacy bit. But what we're able to do is actually, you know, we, we learn from all these calls and it shapes how we deliver the service. That's the first bit of advocacy that happens with it. We make sure we're providing the right service in the right way and, you know, sharing the right kind of resources on our website and making more of these things more available to more people. But being able to give a voice to people who don't want to, can't disclose publicly, but still making sure they're heard and they're considered. And that's, a huge privilege to be able to to give them a platform whilst making sure they keep their confidentiality, their anonymity, their privacy, their the right to privacy. So important. Do you actually hear back from anyone who has been through the system and you've signposted them to other organisations if needed be? And what's the outcome from that? We do. I mean, obviously, we we don't actively follow up. We're we're here for when people want to talk to us, but people will call us and say, hey, I spoke to you a few weeks, a few months, a few years ago. This is what happened. Sometimes they'll they'll write in to thank us. Sometimes we only find out about that because someone sends us an anonymous donation and they'll put a message on there and they'll say, I called you X time ago and now I'm in a better place and I wanted to help someone else. Excellent. And it's wonderful being able to hear from those who can say this helped me i mean apex just you know we're, we're, we're one part of someone's journey they're the ones who do all the work mm. and it's so nice just to know the bit that we do helps make the other bits they're doing easier it's really great when we do hear from people who can say yeah this this helped yeah it makes it worth more oh it's yeah. it's such incredibly good work in that way it's it's really good when we hear from people and they're just able to say that helped me thank you and what they've been able to go on to do it's really really wonderful knowing that that, that people have like, prioritized themselves and driven for what they wanted and they've like made it happen and it's not always how we first imagine it's going to be often it, things aren't are they yeah isn't it? But learning that, you know, that as, as you go through, it's like, actually, I've got to a place where I'm, I'm feeling good. And it's sometimes it's that looking back and you're like, wow, you know, I did all that work and I'm, I've got here and that feels amazing. And it doesn't look like how I pictured it, but it feels better than I imagined. Right. And that's kind of wonderful to hear. We've covered a huge amount of ground over the last few episodes, Kim, and from Rich and I, we just wanted to give you our heartfelt thanks. We've really appreciated it. We've thoroughly enjoyed all those conversations. We know that anybody listening will get a lot from them. There's certainly a lot to think about. And there's a lot that that NAPAC do that 
people need to be more aware of because of the benefits. Yeah. So I'm going to read this out before we close off. So it's in my book called Whispers Over Windermere, which you can buy on Amazon, and it's a poem called No Return. I reach a point of no return. Despair, sadness, inflictions of the mind. I peer into the darkness of my soul. Somewhere deep, a smouldering ember, a glow. I write, draw, chant and meditate. Small rotten branches fall and feed the embers. I work, exercise and routine in place. Despair becomes hope, sadness turns to joy. Inflictions of the mind are combat by default. The phoenix she dives, destroyed by the flame, only to rise anew. Yeah. I like that sentiment. Yeah. So I thought that'd be quite a good ending. And we are very grateful for you, Kim, for all your time, for all the conversations that we've had. And yeah, anybody who's listening, please do support Maypack in whatever way it means that you can. And if need to, please do call and phone in. Yeah, if you're impacted, reach out to them, have a conversation. Yeah. All the support from the lovely the pack will be in the show notes as well. And Thank you a- both so much as well. You've been such yeah. gracious and delightful host. Yes. I wish you all the best. It's been really lovely getting to know you. It is, and we hope you can catch up and do some work together as well. Oh, definitely. Definitely. We shall, I know, speak soon, Kim. Hmm. Thank you.